scripture tells us there is no condemnation for those who belong in Christ Jesus. Today on Better Together, Cece Winans, Stephanie Ike, Nona Jones, Dr. Anita Phillips, and Hosanna Wong are talking about how to become a church that welcomes the wounded and helps all who enter find freedom and hope. Come on, join us. We've been talking about building a healthy church. And today our conversation is centered on creating safe spaces. And I really want to kick it off by reading this scripture in Ezekiel 34 from verse 4 to 6. So it says, The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. Mm. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. Now, in this scripture, the Lord is communicating to um, certain shepherds that have lost sight of their responsibilities. And he was communicating that through the prophet Ezekiel. What stood out to me so much is that he calls the weak the lost, the broken, all of that. He says, these are my sheep, not people that will be my sheep when they have transformation, when they get it together, that in the messiness of their situation, that the Lord identified them as his sheep. And I think we begin to change, um, not even, you know, where, where we see brokenness sometimes in the body, that that perspective begins to change when we embrace how to see people the way Jesus sees people, to to recognize that the messiness of your situation, because that can be expressed in so many ways, that can be expressed in someone who's dealing with lust, it dealing with jealousy, dealing with an identity crisis, all kinds of things, but that Jesus looks and he says, these are still my sheep. The truth of it is that for any of us, and really for all of us, but for those watching as well, that when you come into Christ, there is a transformation that takes place through the intimacy of that relationship. But transformation now becomes the fruit and the evidence of the relationship. But what it takes to get there is a lot of shedding, a lot of unlearning, and literally people on a journey now, I have been in certain, you know, church settings, and it wasn't really about the leadership of the house having a judgmental mindset. But again, the church is for all people, right? Everyone walks in, and there are times where you will see where people can be a bit judgmental, or even just Christians being a bit judgmental, because your way of following Jesus does not look like my way of following Him. But I believe it's getting back to the Word of God. God looks at the lost. God looked at the, the scattered. God looked at all of that and he said, this are my sheep. And again, there is the institution of pastors, prophets, evangelists, and all of that. And in the scripture, when he's talking about shepherds, I believe that we are all shepherds to some capacity. Some of us are shepherds in our home. Some of us are shepherds in the church. Some of us are shepherds for a community. There are teachers that could be watching this and you're shepherds to your the kids in your classroom. And so at the end of the day, it's coming to this place that, hey, when someone one's outlook on life, when so, the way someone carries themselves, it may not look like what I believe is the way in Christ, but maybe you're still in that seed stage. Maybe there's still a work that God is doing in you and I have no knowledge of. You know, our job as believers is to point people to Jesus and it is the Holy Spirit's work to bring transformation. Mm -hmm. And as long as I can say, hey, I'm going to point you to him by being a representation of his love and his truth. And I love it so much much that Jesus, elo I'm not even eloquently, Jesus has the balance of truth and grace, right? Because sometimes we can say, yes, I can speak the truth about Maybe the way your lifestyle doesn't match up with the word of the Lord, but there is also the grace that follows it to say, you know what, you're on a journey and I may not understand your journey because I'm not the one that created you, but it is my job and it is my role to love you and it's my role to point you to Jesus. Some of my closest friends today are people who literally felt like they didn't have a place in the kingdom of God. They didn't have a place in relationship with God simply because they felt like they they were condemned a lot based on their lifestyles. And it's so crazy, the power of just letting someone know, not only
only are you loved by God, but you are also loved by me, that you don't have to change for me to love you. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that the Lord began to highlight to me so um, just really greatly was the case of the lepers in the scripture and that we as a church should not be aligned with the kingdom of darkness to bring people to this place of feeling like because everyone else rejects me, maybe the Lord rejects me too. Mm -hmm. We see this particular story in Matthew that there was a leper that went to Jesus and he said, Lord, if you're willing, cleanse me. It was not that, Lord, I'm not sure if you have the power. I recognize that you're all powerful. And I recognize that you do this for other people, but I'm a leper. Society calls me an outcast. And somehow I've seen how they treat me to think that maybe this is how you're going to treat me. So if you're willing, then you would do this for me. And Jesus, first of all, touches him. He does a thing that you're not even supposed to do with lepers. And then he says, I am willing. And this is who we are called to be as a body. This is who we are called to be as, as believers. And this is how we create safe spaces. When we say, I see you the way the Lord sees you. You are his sheep. You are loved. And I will let the Holy Spirit do that work of transformation. Most definitely. I love that you said that all of this messiness was being called God. God was claiming all of the messiness mm -hmm. because I think we create this false dichotomy between the lost and those who know Jesus as like the broken and the perfect, mm -hmm. the messy and the yeah. organized, you know, like yeah. for some reason outside the church doors, chaos, like walk through the church doors, suddenly everything's fine. <laughs> and anyone, I'll use this example, it's like getting married, right? One day we're not married, then we speak about 50 words. We promise to do something for the rest of our lives. We form this relationship. And then all of a sudden at that moment, we're supposed to know how to be married. We're never supposed to have a fight. We're never supposed to have a problem. When we become the bride of Christ, we still got to grow a, a, some growing to do. There's a learning curve that's still there. And I think we make it unsafe for people because there's this expectation that of the before and after salvation moment where the after is just going to be everything's fine and there's no messiness here. And so then when people find themselves struggling, there's a shame associated with it because we haven't made space for people to safely address the growth, healing, learning curve that this life with Jesus is. Yeah. You know, when we come to Jesus, our spirits are changed instantly, but then our minds have mm -hmm. to be renewed. Every part of our lives have to be renewed. And not just once, God continues to renew us over <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think as as believers and as leaders in the church or people who have been walking as Christians for a long time, I know for me, when I really focus on being like him, then the only time I have left really to do anything is just to love. I, I have time to love people where they are, because when you've walked with the Lord, you know where you've come from. And it's so important. There's so many scriptures in the Bible that tells you to remember, not to forget, you know. And, and the thing is, it's so important to understand that, like she said, when you come into Christ, you're a baby. You're a new creation. Old things are past. All things are new. But the new things you have to learn how to do. You have to learn how to walk, how to talk. And um, it's really a beautiful transition. It's a beautiful transforming uh, thing to see when people come to Jesus. I love to see non-believers, people who don't know anything about Christ, come to him and then begin to walk it out. But you, and when you have patience and when you have love, then people are, are they feel good about the growth that they're experiencing. And I think it is so crucial that when people come to Jesus, when they come to the house of the Lord, that they feel welcome. They feel to, they feel welcome to be who they are, right where they are, because it takes time. It's funny. I was having a conversation with a, a friend recently, and you know, yesterday we talked about having hard conversations, and she and I were, we were thankfully we have the type of relationship that we can have the hard conversations. And um, there was a, a person, a, a black person, unarmed. They were killed by police, and we were having this conversation. And and she said, "Well, you know, uh, they shouldn't have resisted arrest." And uh, I said to her, I said, well, you know, was that a capital crime? <laughs> and she said, well, no, but you know, they, they probably did something wrong. 
And uh, this is a friend of mine who um, is very much so, you know, pro-life. And I said to her, I said, I said, well, help me understand in your mind, you know, what it means to advocate for the, the, the innocent, right? The babies who have never done anything wrong. Uh, and then you look at someone who is killed for something that's not a capital crime. Like, how do we weigh the two? And she said to me, she said, yeah, but they're, they're innocent. They're innocent. And I said to her, I said, what if Jesus viewed us that way? I mean, imagine, like, where would we be if the grace of God only extended to those who had never done anything wrong? We would all be lost. And I think that is what keeps me grounded. It keeps me grounded when I when I both see and do wrong. I reflect on the fact that the grace of God is the only reason why my eternal life is secure. Not because I've done everything right at all. As a matter of fact, the word of God tells us that he loved us so deeply that he died for us while we were sinners, we were not when we had it all together. Like, <laughs> no, like we're literally in the act. There you go. And he's like, you're still worth That's dying good. for. And I think about that and I'm like, Lord, who am I to judge anybody for anything? Right. Um, how, how, how can I put myself on a pedestal to be like, oh, now that is unforgivable. Yeah. Like, I yeah. can't get with that. I just thank God yeah. for his grace. And I think when we have that mindset, um, we will never look down on anybody else because let me tell you something if we had uh some sort of a i'm gonna call it a sin ray so you got an x-ray <laughs> we had a sin ray <laughs> you could just see me and my Ooh. sin you would be like now she don't need to be on no better together now yeah she need to get it together but, come but, on yeah. but you said something though the, the story that we all love you said caught in the act the woman that was caught mm -hmm. in adultery i mean yes what greater example jesus just wrote and was like okay let me let me get out of here. The sin, the sin uh, detector was happening, you know. And and if we just live like that, I think you, you're so grateful to be oh, forgiven. Goodness. First of all, you live a life of so much gratitude Ooh. that you're yes. so you're ready to forgive. You're ready to cover. Mm -hmm. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sin. Yes, a multitude of sin. So sinners should they should really feel. I mean, now the word of God convicts. Always. So they're going to be a little uncomfortable, but it shouldn't, <laughs> but it, let it be the word of God. Let it be the spirit of yes. God, but they should never feel unloved or, or shamed or guilt. Yeah. That should never come with us. I think one of the ways to disrupt the cycle of shame that we see in our families and our communities and in our churches is for us to be honest about where we've been. Come and on. honest about what Jesus has saved us from. Mm -hmm. Because I think a, a reason why this narrative of you have to be perfect and you have to do everything right, and if you're not perfect, you're not welcome here, is just perpetuated throughout our communities is because some of us have spent a long time trying to come off like we've got it all together to curate a lifestyle that is flawless or perfect or not just on social media, but in real life. And if we are not honest about what Jesus has really saved us from, if we're not honest about what Jesus has really redeemed us from, then of course, people in our communities don't know that they're also welcome. Of course, people in our communities don't know how Jesus can actually interact in their real lives. And I think one of the ways that I've been set free from guilt and shame from ways that I've lived and lies that I've believed is by hearing other people on stages and at dinner tables tell me about the lies they've believed. Mm -hmm. and some of the shame they've had and some of the guilt they've had and and how they've been set free from that. And now I'm hearing someone talk about something that I'm like, I've never said that out loud before. And this person is just being very honest. I've lived this way. Jesus set me free from that. I've lived this way. I believe that lie. Jesus set me free from that. And I think that when you hear someone else sharing your story, when you hear that Jesus has redeemed someone like you, you know, it takes, it takes this shame off of you. It takes this, this guilt off of you, this wall. Um, it, it helps take it down a little bit. And you're realizing that Jesus could probably Forgive me too for that. So I think a way to help people not feel shame when they're walking into our churches or entering our communities is for us to be honest about who we are and what we're struggling with and what God has saved us from to reveal the truth about who Jesus is and who he has been through our real lives. 
I think we could also be healthier as a church in creating these safe spaces if we make sure that inside the church, we're not using shame and guilt as tools of discipleship. Mm, We talked about discipleship earlier this week, and I think that's something critical that I've often encountered in, in counseling, both as pastoral counseling and professional counseling, is that in an effort to get our young people to live correctly, yeah. we sometimes use shame and fear about what they should not do, whether it's making someone feel like they will be worth less to God if they aren't sexually pure or making someone feel like they will be worth less to God if they use the substance or anything. And so we're just yeah. using Almost, it's almost like bad parenting skills. I have worked really hard, not a perfect parent, but I've worked really hard to instill in my children that their love relationship with God should inspire them. The Bible says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Didn't say if you were terrified of me, didn't say if you were shamed by me. He said, if you love me. And so I've always tried to present this idea that every relationship has boundaries. And if you're in love with Jesus, then there are some boundaries on the things that you will or will not do. But too often it's been presented as fear and shame. And so people as Christians are afraid to admit when they've had some messiness, it's not safe for Christians to say, hey, I have this going on because shame has been so instilled. And if we use shame as a tool of discipleship, then that's all that a Christian has. Then that's what we'll give. Yeah. Mm. When other people show up, we'll give what we have, which is fear and shame. So I want to just encourage people, if you were discipled using those tools with all good intentions, I'm sure, to try and help you to live a holy life, but had some some bad side effects, um, that one, God can heal you from that and you don't have to perpetuate it to the people that you disciple, that if we love him, we keep his commandments. Let's perpetuate that kind of love. Yeah. And I think it really echoes um, even Hosanna's statement on the the power of the testimony, Mm -hmm. because I think that there's sometimes I've heard when people will have something going wrong in their life. And the first thing they would say is like, oh, my gosh, maybe this is punishment because of this thing that I did. So, again, that shame and guilt becoming the measure in which you feel like, okay, this is not happening because I messed up yesterday. I didn't do the God thing yesterday. And that scripture, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's so powerful because then keeping the commandments becomes the organic response to a love relationship with Jesus. And so testimonies, I think it's everything because when I think about the testimony, other people's testimonies that I've heard that made me feel like, oh, you know, I'm not that crazy. (laughs) And when I look at my life and being able to tell people like, hey, I've had some messiness in my past, but the hand of God was actually still on me and he still blessed me. So I'm not trying to scare you into a life of like, oh, if you don't get this right, then you're going to perish on the earth because we see how people can be living very off and things are happening for them. So it's to even go beyond the layer of, you know, the idea of being blessed, but to say, look, relationship with Jesus is deeper than that. You want this thing. It's not just about like, would good things come to me? You know, bad vibes stay away from me. It's it's bigger than that because I've seen even like in the younger generation and they would say things like, you know, some of the artists I love, they're living the lifestyle I want to live and they're nowhere close to Jesus. (laughs) And so if we measure this idea of success by not, you know, living a life of, you know, that, that kind of disqualifies you from the grace, but telling them like, look, relationship is much deeper. You want Jesus in your life. You need him to give you direction about who you are. You need him. The peace that comes from him is nothing that you can buy. And so when people see the value in a love relationship with Jesus, not a watered down concept on riches and all that stuff, but the value of what is eternal, then it becomes desired. And it's like, oh my gosh, I want to change for this person. I've always been intrigued by the fact that after Adam and Eve mm-hmm. ate the forbidden fruit, mm-hmm. they immediately covered themselves. And I, I've always been intrigued by that because in my mind, I'm like, where did they even get the idea for clothes, right? Like there, there was no Zara, there was no <laughs> JC Penny. Like what led them to, to come to the conclusion that the natural response to doing the wrong thing 
It's the cover up. Like, where'd that even come from? And I think we continue to do that. And I, I read a book many years ago um, by uh, Brene Brown, which was really powerful. She she defined guilt and shame in a way that I had never heard before. And she said, guilt is about uh, the mistake that I make. It's about what I did. Whereas shame is about how I see myself because of what I did. It's about identity. And that's been powerful to me. And that's part of the reason why, you know, as a minister in in the business world, when I do speak in business contexts that have no type of ministry uh, uh, link at all, I always talk about Jesus uh, because he is the one who delivered me from the shame of my past. And what's been interesting is every time I tell my story, every single time I tell my story, people come up to me afterward and they say, that happened to me too and I've never told anyone. And I think to myself, you have people in leadership positions, consequential leadership positions, who are leading from a place of shame. And a lot of times, shame can become the fuel that actually drives you to succeed. Going back to your point, Stephanie, there are many people who have achieved great things, but they've achieved it because they're trying to create a new identity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that new identity is apart from who Christ has said they are, whether they have a credential, whether they have a degree, no matter what they do, they already are amazing, but they don't know that. And so it becomes performative. And so this idea of I'm going to cover up and I'm going to get this title and I'm going to get this position because I don't want to associate with how I really see myself, which is I see myself as damaged goods, but we know that we are set free. We are set free from whoever the enemy has said that we are. We ha- we are new creatures in Christ yeah. Jesus. I love yep. that. You know, I was going to bring up the Garden of Eden as well. Um, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they ran, they hide and hid. Um, but, but I wanted to bring up the Father because Stephanie was talking about the love of God. Amen. And... He kept looking for him. He never changed his mind about them. Amen. Not only did he look for him, so you know, but so because he still wanted to be in relationship. He even found the clothes. He found the czar. <laughs> <laughs> he made them. <laughs> and it just yeah. shows you how much he oh, loves God. us. And his love never ch- is sin changes our perspective of him, not his perspective of us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it messes us up. And I think going back to what Anita said, a lot of times I know when I was growing up, they taught on hell a lot, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't really find out about the love of God until later. I was determined <laughs> that I was going to live right because I wasn't going to hell. But when you understand the love of God, shame just melts away. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, but as unbelievers, new people, they don't know. That's why it's up to us to really show and reveal the love of God, because God, he while we were still sinners, he died for us. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what kind of past you had. There's nothing stronger than the love of God. And God loves you so much. And your value is still intact. You're still valuable to him. You know, and I think when we look at his character, you know, I just love that. He where where are you guys at? Adam, Eve, what happened? What's going on? Let's you know, we used to hang out together. But but sin will will make will bring the shame and 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 cause you to run. And God is saying, I'm still in love with you. I'm thinking about the scripture when it says perfect love casts Mm -hmm. out all fear. And fear has many expressions. Fear can be expressed through shame and guilt. But there's something about embracing the perfect love of the Father that casts out all of that. And so in this moment, I want to pray for everyone watching. And maybe you're you're in that place where you're struggling with shame, you're struggling with guilt, and you're not yet embracing that God loves you, that right where you are, He still calls you my sheep, that He sees all the messiness and He said, you belong to me, I love you, I'm for you, and I'm after you. And so let's just pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your children that are watching this right now. I thank you, Lord, that they would just be just overwhelmed by your love, by your goodness and by your joy. I thank you, Lord God, that even for those that have been struggling with shame and guilt, oh God, that they would know that your love still looks at them and says, you belong to me. 
I got you. I'm here for you. And it's through me that we're going to come out of all of this. And so, Lord, may they embrace you and relinquish everything that causes them to just diminish who they are and the value of their worthiness in you. And so, Lord God, I thank you for that beautiful trade right now, that exchange that is happening. That, Lord, for everything that I have, the narrative I've, I've spoken to myself, that I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, that they're releasing that right now and they're receiving identity they're receiving knowing that they belong to you they're receiving your love and your goodness thank you lord jesus amen at tbn our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of jesus christ thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world and it's because of you that partner with us that this ministry continues god bless you